but unfortunately or fortunately maybe Julien Paolini and his wife have had a baby yesterday and he was unable to join us here in Ajaccio. So Leticia Hugo from the Office de l'Environnement de la Corse and uh, the Conservatoire Botanique Corse accepted kindly to give the opening address. Leticia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Claude. And uh, yes, as you guess, I'm not uh, Julien Paolini. Uh, he's very sorry for his absence, but okay, he's waiting uh, and for uh, and happy even. So I'm going to read his talk. Uh, dear colleague, as administrator of the Office of the Environment and Office of Agriculture of Corsica, as well as researcher at the University Pascal Paoli, it's a great pleasure and privilege to welcome you in this island for this Britain European conference on Xylella fastidiosa. The diversity of targets we are going to discuss about during those two days as microbiologists, pathogenicity vectors, modeling, and so on, with numerous sharp technicities, give us good indicator how large is the question. Moreover, the variety of stakeholders concerned by this problem really linked to human activities as territorial strategies reinforce that for his global subject, local management is needed. I know that some of you will stay on Thursdays. It's a wonderful opportunity to discover Corsican landscape, rug agriculture environment in the Prunelli or Gravona Valleys. Nearly 400 participants from more or less 40 countries in Ajax, in Ajax, in Ajaccio, in Corsica, and some on the net attending this conference. But may I remember you that a lot of people are waiting for your results, and some perhaps more than 400 participants, uh, from, for, for more hundred um, people. This question is complex, and we have to do with, but no knowledge is essential to go ahead. So I wish you successful work and fruitful debate and a nice stay in Corsica. Thank you for your attention. So now I will give you some details about the conference and maybe to open, no, this is not the one, yes. So this is the second European conference on Xylella fastidiosa and the subtitle chosen is how research can support solutions. So we are here in one of the most beautiful place in the world, in Ajaccio, but uh, we are not here to look at the sea or the landscape. We are here because Europe is facing a major issue in plant health since the discovery of Xylella fastidiosa in Puglia in 2013. And I don't have to remember you, Xylella fastidiosa is considered as one of the most dangerous plant bacteria in the world. With the support of EFSA, we were able to organize a workshop in Brussels in 2015 with uh, 100 participants looking at the knowledge gaps and uh, the research priorities for EU. And this workshop was followed by a conference in Palma de Mallorca, the first European conference on Xylella fastidiosa with the subtitle Finding Answers to a Global Problems and in Mallorca, we have had more than 260 participants. 
we have now the second European conference, and this was and is co-organized by several actors, EFSA, EFRESCO, ANSES, l'Agence Nationale de Sécurité Sanitaire de l'Alimentation, de l'Environnement et du Travail, c'est long word, INRA, l'Institut National de la Recherche Agronomique, the Office de l'Environnement de la Corse et le Conservatoire Botanique Corse, and several EU-funded research projects. We have at the Ponte meeting yesterday, XF Actors, Cure XF, the Cost Action Eurocent. And we will have a two-day conference, which, which, which is quite uh, heavily packed, uh, nine sessions, a poster session, and there is a field trip which is organized by the end of the conference. We are more than 350 people attending the conference uh, with a very wide participation also from all over the world. You have the countries outside EU that have been listed here. And uh, a very wide participation. I, sh I would like to mention that uh, besides the researchers, uh, we have also um, participation from stakeholders, and the private sector, uh, and, and of course, uh, people involved in the institutions and the management. Maybe important to, to mention what we should do here is, of course, look at the latest research results from the EU research projects, especially we will have a note uh, delivery of what is the outcome of the Ponte project. We will also discuss the latest achievements at the national and transnational research level. We hope to be able to interact with the stakeholders on, on these key research achie achievements so far. And we should think about ways of strengthening coordination and synergies in between these uh, actions. What we will not address during this conference, is, this is also important, is that we will not deal with the legislation and we will not discuss the rules or the implementation of phytosanitary measures. So coordination and synergies, discuss new findings and key research achievements. I would like also to stress the importance of mobilizing the young scientists around this uh, issue of Xylella fastidiosa and the interaction with the stakeholders. And of course, we will try to do our best to allow for interaction and ex exchanges in between also. You did uh, receive the conference program. This is a paperless event, and maybe I should uh, stress this. Um, we have several, oh, this is too fast. Um, we have um, several sessions that will take place in this uh, auditorium, Pascal Paoli, in the ground floor. We have been obliged to organize parallel sessions, so sessions three, five, and eight will take place in the room San Piero Corso at the second floor. The coffee breaks and the lunches will take place in the restaurant Tino Rossi at the second floor also, and we will have a networking networking cocktail and the poster session will take place in the hall d'exposition Napoleon Bonaparte, which is on the ground floor and you, you found it when you registered. So this is uh, a display of, of uh, where we are, so you can have a look at, we are here at the auditorium here you've got the poster and cocktail area. And on the second floor, we have the meeting room and uh, the restaurant uh, Tino Rossi. So may I remind you to switch off your mobile phone. And uh, you may follow us on uh, social media. You've got the indication here. You have had indication about the Wi-Fi code, which is uh, on your badge. 
the conference will be web streamed, which means that uh, during the conference, I'm sorry, uh, please try not to connect to the web streaming to allow excellent remote connections. As I mentioned, this is a paperless event. Uh, so all the conference documents are available via a link that you may find on the web. So the link is xylela2019.eu. And if you connect, you will have all the information, all the documents related to the conference. As you have seen, uh, we have uh, the support of a numerous uh, staff uh, with their very nice t-shirts, so you may spot them. If you have any question, please ask them. They are there for you. Thank you very much for your attention, and please enjoy the conference. So it, it is now my pleasure to invite Steve Lindo professor at the University of California, Berkeley, to, for his presentation, Advances in Molecular and Ecological Studies for the Control of Xylella fastidiosa. Steve. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, good morning, everybody. It's really a pleasure to uh, give an introductory talk today. I'd really like to talk to the, uh, to the theme of the meeting, and that's how research can support solutions. And today, I'd really like to uh, uh, really kind of give us kind of a background information about what we've, we and others have learned about the biology of, of xylella, because I think we've actually learned enough, at least in the case of the grape system, to, uh, to make some real progress. So I will be talking exclusively about uh, Pearson disease and, and grape today, but uh, hopefully a lot of what we're learning about grape and xylella will also apply to some of the other important uh, hosts for the disease. Now, I want to emphasize that I'm, going to, I'm a bacteriologist. I'm going to talk about microbiology, but we can't think about xylella without thinking about insect vectors. And a lot of the biology of xylella seems to be associated very strongly with its ability to interact with these different insect vectors. And the first part of my talk is going to be to talk about how xylella has to live in two very different kind of environments. And that's made it a very complicated pathogen, but it also has been, I think, kind of the, the tools that we're going to need to defeat it is to perhaps trick it or, or under, at least understand what it needs to do to live in a, in a plant, but also in the vectors which are required for transmission. Now, almost every picture of xylella shows one like this, where we see the xylem vessels being colonized by the bacteria. And I think that that will certainly happen. But I'd also like to suggest that that's probably an atypical situation, and that much of the uh, symptoms that we see might, in fact, be due to uh, responses of the plant to the pathogen. And I've always been impressed by this study from the University of California, Davis, where they have been looking at these uh, tyloses, these plant defensive molecules that block the vessels to try to move, uh, prevent the movement of the pathogen. And I thought they've made fairly compelling argument that the bacterium as it moves through the plant is being perceived by the plant. The plant tries to stop it by blocking the movement of the pathogen. Uh, with these little balloon-like objects which are going to prevent its movement. But they, at least in grape, it shows that that is a very uh, d a damaging response to the plant. And I've always kind of wondered then that we're talking about disease of plants that are now seeing xylella for the first time. The plant may be trying to react very strongly to xylella, but it may be overreacting. And a lot of it is probably suicide uh, by the plants that are overreacting to the presence of the uh, uh, pathogen. So perhaps if we understood what those triggers for tyloses production might be, we could modify the plant so that it did not overlap and could coexist a little bit better with the pathogen. Because it may be that plants do tolerate quite a lot of xylella in the tissue, and it may be this overreaction that we need to worry about. Now what our work in grape has kind of told us anyway is that the movement of the pathogen of the through the plant is, is an amazingly efficient process. And much of what I'm going to talk about is about movement. Because as the, as the pathogen is introduced into just a few xylella uh, vessels, it spreads through thousands of vessels and moves meters through a plant you know, within weeks. And uh, so movement seemed to be just essential for its success. 
Again, as it moves through the plant, some of the vessels are going to be blocked both by uh, the action of the bacteria plugging the vessel, but probably also by talosis. But again, we've got these detours, the pits through which water can move around vessels as they get blocked. But it's a progressive disease, as you know, that as more and more vessels get blocked, there are fewer detours. And so as the water cannot get around many of these different blockages, eventually we get water stress symptoms that I think is at the heart of many of the, of the symptoms that we see in these plants. So I think, again, that movement is, is quite essential. Without the movement, this is not going to be nearly the important colonist or pathogen in this case that we would want to try to control. So again, we need to kind of think a little bit about plant anatomy when we talk about this organism in that, uh, again, it moves from one vessel clearly into many, many other vessels. And we just look a little at anatomy. Here's two paired uh, xylem vessels here, similar vessels here. And again, the vessels, bet uh, between vessels, the water can move through these what we call pits. Small pores, which have these filters called pit membranes, or basically very thin cell walls, which basically act as filters that attempt to prevent the movement of the pathogen from one vessel over into the other. But the pathogen apparently can degrade these pits, uh, destroy the filter, if you would, and move from one vessel into the next. <laughs> now, one of the very first things that we observed in our studies of xylella and grape was that most of the cells of the pathogen are not found in these vessels that are very heavily colonized, like you saw in that scanning electron microwave picture early. But the more typical situation would be just a relatively few cells in a given vessel, shown by these GFP level cells. For every one of these vessels that have a very high number of bacteria, there are hundreds that have much lower numbers. So it seemed to spread very extensively in the plant without typically having many of the vessels that are very heavily colonized. And so much of what I'm going to talk about in the first part is our understanding of the difference in the biology that is happening in a situation like this, where the cells are heavily colonized, compared to the typical cell in the plant, which is uh, spread out in very small numbers. I would consider this kind of an example of an, of an endophytic existence. It may be quite common in many plants. It spreads quickly and, and extensively throughout the plant without necessarily causing any symptoms. Now, our work early on also showed that it moves amazingly efficiently. And that, again, we have a picture here where we have our green mark xylella in one vessel. So here's the inside of one vessel. Here's the inside of another vessel. You can see these little pores. And you can actually see the bacteria moving through the pores. And we have a lot of pictures like this. I would have thought it would have been impossible to ever see it. But in fact, you can, in fact, see it moving again from one vessel to the next. It seemed to be very good at moving. I guess that's why it's such a good colonist of plants. Uh, but it also may be one of the things that we should be targeting is to prevent this movement uh, from one part of the plant to the next. And the other observation that we made that kind of made us think about these density dependent effects that we are going to be looking at in the first part of my discussion is the fact that as it starts to get colonized, those vessels that you see with large numbers of bacteria in them, like you see here, these are all green mark bacteria, but we also stain them with propidium iodide, which will stain dead cells red. And so here you see a vessel with a lot of bacteria. Here's a vessel or two up here with much smaller numbers of cells in them. And you see the cells that were in relatively uncolonized vessels are still alive. Whereas the vessels that are heavily colonized, many of the bacteria are in fact dead. So it actually probably is bad for the pathogen to actually grow to these very high numbers that we can you know, periodically see. So these several observations about the cells dying when they get crowded, the fact that most of the cells are in relatively small numbers, made us think more about what are the density dependent behaviors. And there's a lot of interest these days in microbiology of bacteria that are addressing what we call quorum sensing. The ability of bacteria to change their gene expression as a function of how locally concentrated their cell density is. And Xylella fastidio was the very first plant pathogenic bacterium to have its genome determined by uh, uh, the workers in Brazil. And one of the first things that we observed when we observed uh, the, uh, the sequences were the fact that these bacteria have a number of genes which are very similar to those in Xanthomonas compestris. It's most 
uh, close relative, that were related and shown in that case to be involved in, in a very different type of quorum sensing system. Genes that were regulating expression of virulence in that case in Xanthomonas, the RPFF cluster, regulation of pathogenicity factors. And uh, those, those were shown in Xanthomonas to have produced a small fatty acid signal molecule a few years ago, which was required for the expression of virulence. Virulence is not expressed in Xanthomonas until the cells become high in, in local cell density. We found that Xylella had a similar subset of these regulation uh, factors. And our own work had shown that they, in fact, also produce a series of fatty acids that are used as density signals. The higher the concentration of cells, the more of these small fatty acids are going to be produced. And that, in turn, is perceived and changes the expression of the, of the genes in the bacterium. I should point out that uh, Xylella has a very different set of fatty acid signals than does Xanthomonas. But otherwise, the system seems to be in somewhat of a, of a parallel uh, situation. And again, just a simplified story of quorum sensing in Xylella and Xanthomonas is that there's two genes, the RPFF, which is involved in the production of these fatty acids. Fatty acids are produced by the bacterium. They diffuse away from the bacterium. If the bacteria in high cell density, the signal molecules increase in concentration, they're reperceived by the bacterium with the RPFC, and that in turn turns on a, a complicated intracellular pattern of gene expression, which turns on and off about 10% of the genes in xylella. But what's important to what I want to talk about is what those genes are. And uh, it turns out to be very different from that of almost all other bacteria in that uh, the genes for virulence are actually turned off when the bacteria start to become in high cell density. Because unlike Xanthomonas, where the, the disruption of that signaling system prevented uh, virulence of Xanthomonas, in Xylella, it, it's the opposite. Oops, it's just the opposite, that the, uh, the mutants that do not have the ability to perceive its neighbors with a cell signaling system are very, very much more virulent than the wild-type strain. So virulence is turned off when the cells start to become in high cell density because of their accumulation of these signal molecules. But what was also really interesting, and come thinking back to the insect vector again, those very, very virulent cells that uh, were killing the plant very much more quickly than the wild-type strain were not capable of being transmitted from one plant to the next via the insects. That is, the wild-type strain were in, uh, transmitted with the sharpshooter vectors quite efficiently, whereas the mutants were virtually non-transmissible. And the reason for that seemed uh, pretty obvious when uh, uh, we looked inside the insect's uh, mouth and throat, if you would, and that you can see that the pathogen forms a very thick covering of the surfaces within the insect head and, and throat, the pre-Siberium, whereas the mutant strain uh, produces, it really does not attach to the inside of this mouth. The insects are sucking large volumes of liquid through these little throats. The, the, concentrate, the, the flow of liquid through that mouth is very, very fast. The logic seemed to be then that to be able to be retained within those insects, it has to be sticky enough, otherwise it's going to go right through the insect. They certainly, the insects were acquiring lots of cells and feeding on the mutants that were not capable of uh, being as sticky. But in fact, the ones that were not sticky were also not retained by the insect. You're not retained, you can't be transmitted. So again, to think back now about what are the traits that are being regulated by this cell density? What is turned uh, off when they start to accumulate the uh, signal molecule when they're found in these high cell densities are basically the things that we would have thought would make nice virulence factors. Cellulases, uh, pectinases, type 4 pili that are involved in a, basically a crawling action that allows the cells to move along vessels even against the flow of the liquid. But what was turned on when the cells become more concentrated are what I would consider antivirulence factors. Basically everything that made them sticky, a variety of hemagglutinin and adhesions that make them stick to various surfaces, uh, extracellular polysaccharide, which kind of glues them down onto surfaces, type 1 pili, which kind of act like anchors, 
Uh, these and several other things which you could logically affect adhesion to a surface are all induced when they are part uh, of a large a group. And sure enough, when we looked at the behavior of these organisms, both in culture and in the laboratory, in plants, we found that compared to the wild type strain, the uh, mutants that were blocked in this adhesion are much uh, less sticky. The fraction of cells that are released from, say, the uh, interior of a plant, so we take an infected plant, infected with a wild type cell or from the mutant that was not capable of producing a signal, they are not stuck to the plant. They come boiling out of the end of the cut stems, out of the end of the vessels. So again, it really does appear that the adhesion is, in fact, induced by the cells as they start to become part of a large group. And I can't emphasize this more, that almost all other bacteria where virulence is, is associated with adhesion and biofilm formation, the opposite seems to be the true for xylella that we've made a variety of different mutant strains that are differing in their virulence, and I'll show that on a scale on the bottom here, where the cells are more sticky on the left and less sticky on the right, the fraction of cells that are released from the plant, if you would. And the amount of disease that we see in grape when we inoculate, you'll see that the ones that are less sticky are actually much more virulent, and there's a very direct relationship. And we think, again, that this is associated with their ability to move around the plant. If they're very sticky, they're not able to move as quickly or as far, and for that reason, they're either not blocking the vessel themselves or causing the plant to block the vessel because of their presence. Now, just a little hint about how all this might link to uh, control. I just want to talk a little bit more about what, what signals are being communicated between these bacteria. Now, I showed you the different fatty acid signal molecules, the ones from Xanthomonas. They tend to be short chain fatty acids, so about 10 or 11 fat carbons in length. Xylella is much more promiscuous. It can perceive fatty acid signals here from about 11 up to around 20 carbons in length. But I'll come back to this to suggest that we might be able to modify its behavior by exposing them to these uh, fatty acid signals, especially those of relatively long uh, chain length. So again, why, why is Syringi uh, xylella doing this? Why does it have this density behavior? And again, think back about those two hosts. You've got a plant and you've got a, an insect. It has to do well in both. If it can't leave the plant, it's going to die out in the plants that it's colonized. And so what we think is going on is that this has been a complicated way for it to do well in the two different worlds that it has to live in, with both the plant and both in the insect. And again, we think that in the plant, the most typical situation is this one, where we had a few cells in a given vessel. In that kind of a situation, if you think of the liquid flowing through the vessel, any signal molecule that the bacteria would have made probably would dissipate. It wouldn't see very much signal. And that's what I'm going to show here with the uh, green bars. As they start to become more and more concentrated within a vessel, then there'll be more signal. So we think then that the populations of the cells within a given plant are going to be partitioned into those which are kind of solitary in the plant. And those solitary cells, remember, they're not sticky. They're making these uh, active uh, movement uh, possible. They're also degrading the plant. They're probably eating and growing uh, at the same time. Movement and growth are probably linked. They have to move through the plant. They're eating the pits as a, as a form of nutrient. And if they're trying to move, uh, they're probably also not going to uh, want to stick themselves with gum. A subset of the cells, those that are going to be found in this relatively high cell density, are going to now uh, be sticky. They're not going to try to move, and they're going to be anchored. So it's, again, a way for it to be good at both of these incompatible reactions. To be a good mover in the plant, you're not going to be transmitted and vice versa. So again, rather than being an okay pathogen and good enough as being vectored, it partitions its population so that some cells are transmissible and others are going to colonize plants. So we think that is really this kind of unique way of, of, of being good at everything that it needs to do. Now, one last trick I want to show before we try to get into how any of this information links to possible control, and that is the idea that, again, 
they need to move around in the plant. And one of the things that we found that seems to enable them to move is their production of these vesicles. So these are little rod-shaped bacteria, but they spit out little bits of their outer membrane in what we call outer membrane vesicles. So you'll see on the surface of these cells these little bumps, and they're vesicles. Xylella is the, one of the most promiscuous producers of these vesicles. Uh, almost all gram-negative bacteria produce at least some, but compared to E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa and even Xanthomonas, Xylella makes a lot. They're very small. They're only about 100 nanometers in diameter. They're about a little less than 10% at max the diameter of the bacteria. But there are lots of them. There are, there are hundreds and hundreds of them that are made for any individual bacteria. And what's interesting also is that their release from the bacterium is also controlled by the cell density. That their uh, numbers are, that are released are also much lower when they are in a wild type cell. When there's no signal around, they spit them out. So the uh, significance of this we found when we exposed the plant to the bacterium and to the vesicles at the same time. In a very simple experiment, you can take a, a bit of a grape stem and you could fill it full of buffer or a solution containing vesicles that were separated from the bacteria, let it sit in the, in the plant for a, an hour, flush them away with more liquid, and then put some xylella cells within that and then let them interact with the plant to see if they would stick. Flush them out and then grind up the plant to see how many bacteria stuck. And the answer was basically that the xylella does not stick to the plant if there were vesicles also present in that plant. We think, and we haven't proven yet, that it's really a competition, that they are covering the surface of the plant, at least those parts of the plant where the bacterium normally would stick, and in the presence of the vesicle, uh, they are not able to stick. And we think of it kind of like the, the coating on cookware, the Teflon that you put on, plant, on surfaces that prevents things from sticking we think this is the Teflon of the bacterial world that is blocking attachment. It's not just a laboratory artifact. You can see these vesicles within the plant. Uh, you can see here the, uh, the antibodies that we have raised to a particular protein that's abundant on the surface of these uh, vesicles. And the uh, vesicles can be seen in the sap, especially in plants where the uh, vesicle production is not uh, re inhibited by the uh, signaling. So, interesting biology has got this complicated lifestyle, but we think we can use that against the pathogen, that we can uh, modify its behavior. Once it's in a plant, I think it's gonna be almost impossible to ever eradicate it, but uh, we can probably change the way in which it grows and moves in a plant. And the first strategy that I'm gonna talk about is to uh, employ what we would call pathogen confusion where we're going to uh, prematurely expose the, the pathogen to the signal molecule, which is going to trick it into thinking it's one of, in one of those high uh, concentration colonized vessels and therefore not wanting to further move around in the plant. And so uh, you can kind of see our expectation there, but the idea would be to basically enable or allow infection to happen, but prevent any further growth and movement within the plant. So I'll show you three different strategies, the transgenic plants that we've made that are producing the signal molecule, even in plants which are not yet colonized, uh, directly applying xylo the uh, signal molecule, something the growers are familiar with, could we somehow put the signal in directly? And I'm gonna finish up talking about endophytes, and we had hoped to use endophytes to produce the signal, but I'm gonna tell you a very different story about endophytes, which is, we think, fairly dramatic. So again, the logic of the pathogen confusion strategy would be to allow infection to happen but prevent the severe infections that might result from various systems. And again, think about what's happening when the insects transmit the pathogen. It moves into a plant in small numbers. Probably only a few cells are ever transmitted by the insect vector. As such, they're not going to be inhibited in their movement. Remember, they're free to move until they start to get part of a large group. So they move very quickly. <coughs> they quickly move into hundreds and hundreds and thousands of vessels. And I'm gonna show them as modal because of their green color. 
But then a few vessels where they say we, they do start to get more concentrated. And in those vessels, presumably the signal molecule, which I show here in the yellow, has become more concentrated. And those now are no longer probably participating much in the colonization of the plant, but they are in a situation where they can be acquired by the vector. We don't think the vector acquires most of the cells in a plant very efficiently. It can only acquire those which are part of these uh, concentrated cell uh, assemblages uh, very efficiently. A transgenic plant or some of the other strategies, the idea would be that the plant would itself now have signal molecule right at the time infection would have happened. The pathogen would immediately sense that it was part of a group when it wasn't really. It was simply a signal that we put into the plant. And as such, it presumably would not uh, be able to move very much because it had taken on this new phenotype. So we made transgenic plants. We took the, the single gene from the pathogen needed for the fatty acid production, the DSF synthase, put it into grape, and uh, it made a very dramatic change in the susceptibility of those plants to the infection. So the, the normal grape without the signal being made is shown in the blue. And these were all different transgenic lines that we had expressed the signal molecule. Uh, you could detect it with, DS, with uh, mass spectrometry. It's needed in only nanomolar concentration. That's about all we could measure, but it seemed to be enough to, again, enable the change in the behavior. That you can see that there was a little infection, but only right at the point of inoculation. The pathogen apparently was not moving very much. Another work we've shown that, in fact, the cells were very sticky. They didn't grow, and they didn't move very much. So you're not preventing infection, but you're preventing the movement that we associate with symptoms. So we've done some field studies over the years, and they work pretty much like we had seen in the greenhouse. So we planted them at a couple of sites in northern and southern California. And we see that we're just like in the greenhouse, we see about a fourfold reduction in the symptom development. Again, the plants are becoming infected, but the symptoms are greatly reduced. This is at Riverside in Southern California. You can see on the, the signal producing plants on the top, you see a few leaves that have become symptomatic, but compared to the many leaves that became symptomatic on the bottom, you do see a fairly dramatic reduction in the overall disease severity. Now, I just want to show one slide from some very nice work which uh, Alessandra D'Souza has, has done in Brazil with a similar strategy, making transgenic citrus. And uh, again, a very similar kind of phenomenon whereby the normal uh, citrus is showing extensive symptoms, much less symptom development and apparently less movement of the plant through the, uh, of the pathogen through the plant uh, when it's made the uh, signal molecule because of the presence of the synergy. So it looks like it could be a transferable strategy to other crops. You're not preventing infection, but you could apparently uh, reduce symptom development. Now, one other strategy which doesn't involve transgenic plants, which I'm sure most of the world and certainly Europe wouldn't like to see, is uh, the uh, direct application of the signal molecule. And this is something we are attempting. It's not as successful, probably for practical reasons. Now, the signal, these fatty acids that the xylella makes are uh, very distinct from the normal fatty acids you see in, say, membrane lipids and all. Uh, but we did find that one of the more common naturally occurring fatty acids, palmetolaic acid, so here is this, the, the most active signal molecule made by xylella. The unsaturation is at the number two carbon. Palmetolaic acid is a single similar molecule with the unsaturation at the number nine carbon. You can buy palmetolaic acid, but you can also saponify various uh, vegetable oils that are rich in palmetolaic acid. So what we've done then is to uh, uh, spray on, if you would, palmetolaic acid in various forms, especially as saponified uh, lipids, uh, and we can get modest reductions in disease severity. Compared to the control, we're seeing some reduction in disease, and I think there's some potential for this. If we can figure out how better to get fatty acids into a plant, I think that's really the big issue. How do you get them across the cuticle and into the plant? Now, the last couple of minutes, I'd like to talk about another strategy, which actually was triggered by our thinking about using endophytic bacteria. Maybe we could use naturally occurring endophytes that might make the signal molecule and also fill up the plant with signal. But that required us to find bacteria that grew well within grape, and we could never find anything. 
that grew well within grapes that weren't also pathogens. But there had been reports of a, another bacterium, uh, Paraburkaldaria phytofermens is its new name, it's a Burkaldaria strain, that had been shown to grow within uh, various other plants, including grape. So we, we got a culture of it from uh, Angela Sessage, who'd done a lot of work with this strain, and we found that sure enough, it could colonize grape quite well. We were very impressed. So this is the population size log as a function of distance from the point of inoculation. You can get millions of bacteria in the plant, and it can move within a few weeks, you know, meters in a plant, just like the pathogen. We said, great, let's put the genes for the synthase into that strain. Maybe it could grow enough to produce a signal molecule. But as a control, we used the strain itself as a, uh, as to colonize. And we found that we could see dramatic reduction in disease even when we had not put the sig signal synthase gene into that strain. What I'm going to show you here then is simply uh, disease symptoms as a function of time after inoculation. In a grape, it takes about 10 or 12 weeks to start to see symptoms. Here's pathogen alone. And this little blue line is the pathogen where we had inoculated the normal, unmodified paraburkaldaria. And we didn't see any disease. And I said, wow. We tried it again, we tried it again. I couldn't believe it, and it always about the same. There was very little of any disease when it was also present in the plant together with the pathogen. And more importantly, and, and quite distinct from what we saw with our pathogen confusion, where we get infection, the pathogen is present in the plant, but it's not moving enough to really cause symptoms. In this situation, again, we're going to look at the pathogen population in the orange, and then the, the uh, uh, this is the pathogen alone, and this is the pathogen in the presence of the paraburkaldaria. We had a hard time ever finding viable cells of the pathogen in plants that were also inoculated with paraburkaldaria. It was as though it was dying in the presence of the paraburkaldaria. And that was also very highly re reproducible. It works in all the different varieties that we've looked at in grape, which is great. It wasn't just something... Uh, about that, and then we thought, okay, this, this might actually be something that would be worth examining, but rather than inoculating with a needle into individual vines, which would be not particularly practical, we examined other strategies to put this into a plant, and we found that we could inoculate plants with this uh, bacterium by spraying it on with uh, organosilicon surfactants that allow penetration through the stomata, and you can get water congestion bacteria moving into the plant very, very quickly, as you can see, those dark spots. And we can get you know, millions of bacteria into the plants within minutes by spraying it on with these particular organosilicon surfactants. And you're doing so both by direct inoculation but also by spraying, we found that we could control the disease very dramatically. And again, this is simply disease versus time again. <coughs> and this is a pathogen alone. And you don't need to talk about all the different treatments, but when you put it on before the pathogen, you can get control. You can put it in after the pathogen, which is something I would have never expected. Some of our very best control is when we inoculated the plants with the pathogen, waited a month before we inoculated with the paraburkaldaria. So it was, it's, it's been very reproducible and very dramatic and great. <coughs> and the real question is what, what's going on? The preliminary data suggests that it is what we would call priming the plants for disease resistance. And some very nice work from uh, Caroline Roper at UC Riverside has shown that one of the reasons xylella is so successful as a pathogen is that the, path, the plant does not seem to react at all or certainly not very rapidly to the pathogen. And let's just look at this top line, which is the PR1 gene expression, one of the typical proteins that's associated with resistant reaction in plants. And look at the pathogen alone. You'll see very little or any, uh, no expression of the uh, PR1 gene when you put the pathogen alone in. If you put the paraburkal dairy in by itself, you see a little bit of response, but you'll see a much more dramatic response of PR1 when they're both together. And this is kind of a classic symptom of, of priming, where the two together are now being perceived by the plant, and you get a very robust plant response. So moving forward then, we've done a number of field trials. I'll just show you a couple of examples from uh, two years worth of field studies and uh, a lot of different treatments here. Just look at the two. These are the, the controls are these darkest ones here. So I'll just look at this one as a control. 
When you put the paravertical dairy in before the pathogen or even after the pathogen, you'll see a very dramatic reduction in disease. It's about fourfold reduction in disease. But what was more interesting about this is that it is an all or none response. It's not like the plants all become infected with the pathogen and simply show less symptoms. What we typically see is that the plants either become infected in the presence of paraburcalderia or they do not. And you can see that here with the top. So look at the, oops. Oh, no, I've really done it. Uh, Yeah, thank you. So basically, if you, oh well. <laughs> that was the last slide. What you'll see then with the, when you put the pathogen in alone, almost all the plants become infected. Uh, but if you put the paraburcalderia in, about 80% of the plants do not become infected at all. And only about 10, 10 to 20% of the plants still become infected. It's as though the plant has now been sensitized sensitized to the presence of the pathogen 80% of the time and has completely eradicated the plant, the pathogen, apparently by some sort of robust plant defense. So we think it's, it's quite attractive. Uh, there may be multiple applications and different strategies that we can inoculate, but at least in grape, it's looking like an impressively effective method that could be applied fairly practically. So I just want to stop here, and uh, again, thanks for the invitation to tell you about what we've been doing. We've had a group of different people working on different aspects of this that uh, make it all possible. But we think that looking at the biology, these things really can give us some real insight as to how we might control the disease. Thank you. So. Thank you very much, Steve, for this excellent talk, which shows effectively how oh, uh, understanding the biology of this uh, very special bacteria can help of thinking about the control also. So now the, the, the floor is open for questions. I think there are some microphone in the auditorium moving. May I ask you if you want to ask a question, maybe to present yourself, and once you have asked the question, maybe to hand over uh, the microphone. If, if I, I can see you, <laughs> so maybe I have one question. Uh, oh, there, there is a couple one. Of questions. Okay, uh, Marianne, yes. Do you have the microphone? It's here, Marianne. Uh, no, uh, or do you want? Question in the middle, yeah. Okay, I start. Ralf Köpnik, okay. IRD Montpellier, France. I wonder if this priming effect is due to lysed xylella bacteria so that uh, uh, components of the cytoplasm, like the elongation factor, get exposed and can be recognized by the plant. And then, if so, is this effect dependent on the presence of a type 4 or type 6 secretion system in the brocoderia? The resistant, uh, Caroline Roper has a very nice nature of communication paper that addresses this. And what she found was that the, uh, the, the pathogen seemed to mask itself from perception by the plant by uh, uh, modifying its lipopolysaccharide. So she was showing that LPS seemed to be a sufficient elicitor for plant uh, defenses uh, if it was ma uh, not masked by the O antigen. So it looks like it's, it's a typical PAMP as we might think of about it, but the pathogen has evolved a mechanism which at least in grape has apparently uh, prevented the, per uh, the perception by this modification of that LPS PAMP. Does that make sense or was that answer to your question? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Steve, for this very interesting talk. I've got a question because you mentioned while comparing your RP of mutants and the wild type strain that stickiness of xylella is very important for insect transmission. And I wonder if you have any data on the variability of the stickiness of the cells in natural xylella populations. And if you see that in those natural populations that may differ for this stickiness, they are more or less able to be insect transmitted. Uh, can, can, uh, one more time. Okay, you showed. You I'm, not, showed I'm, not, I'm not good at hearing, so. Yeah. 
you showed with the RPF uh, mutant and the wild type that stickiness of the allela is very important yeah. for insect transmission. Yeah. So I wondered if in natural populations of xylella you have variability for stickiness, and if in those natural populations of xylella that are more or less sticky, they are more or less able to be transmitted by insects. We've not done enough. We've mostly worked on one or two strains, so we have never really examined the natural variation of these sort of things. It was w one thing that might relate to that, though. It, it's, it's perhaps a little bit to the side. Uh, some work which uh, Rodrigo Almeida's group had done, which had made uh, mutants of uh, RPFF in other strains that didn't typically infect grape. Uh, when those RPF genes were knocked out, the virulence toward grape was greatly increased. So basically, it went from not being able to infect grape to increase to basically almost natural virulence towards grape. So that kind of hints that it may be that modulation of common virulence factors is involved in this host range that we might see, but that's very speculative. Yeah, there are some over there. The microphone is um, coming. Sorry, um, this is me. Okay, <laughs> here. Yeah, you've got it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your oral presentation. It was very interesting. I was asking, what do you think about the relation between the SF production and the vesicle um, delivery? What is the biochemical way by which there is an influence? Thank you. There's a lot of interest in vesicle production in gram-negative bacteria, especially because they're very uh, central to the biology of a lot of human pathogenic bacteria and all. And there's about 10 different models about how vesicles are released from the bacteria. Uh, we have no idea what the mechanism would be here. One of the thoughts would be is that there's an imbalance in the membrane protein production which destabilizes a membrane and causes it to be released. That's one of the two or three models that are shown, shown in other bacteria. We do know that these outer membrane production, uh, outer membrane pr protein production is one of the very strongly regulated phenotypes that's under control of DSF in xylella, so it may be some kind of an indirect effect that's modifying the membrane composition which causes them to be released. But there's so many contentious mechanisms that people are pushing for vesicle relief that we can't really be sure. Okay. Leonardo? Okay. Um, Leo de la Fuente from Over University. Uh, so my question is, you talk about how, you know, the, the thinking of uh, Karen Roper, for instance, <laughs> that the bacteria is not recognized by the plant because it's masked. But then at the beginning, you talk about the tylos production and the response of the plant to the pathogen. So how do you think these you know, different thoughts can come together? Or like, is it recognizing the plant or not the pathogen? I'm not really sure what to say about that one. Um, I, th I found it fascinating that, um, maybe I'll do, I'll do a little left-hand turn here, but uh, I'm very intrigued by the results of, uh, of uh, Caroline Roper in that we had always wondered how xylella interacts with living plant tissue in the first place. It lives in the, in the xylem, which is dead tissue. It doesn't have type 3 secretion, so it really isn't trying to interact directly with uh, living tissue. But basically, how does a PAMP, like a lipopolysaccharide, ever interact with the living plant? And I guess the question would be, are these <coughs> LPS molecules making their way through pits to the, to the uh, xylem parenchyma, which are living plant tissue? <coughs> and uh, if there were ways to modify their um, increase their perception, for example, that might be a way to sensitize plants. I don't know if that answered your question at all, but yeah. Okay. Pasquale yeah. Saldarelli from Bari, CNR. So I question, how many applications of paraburcolderia did you perform in the field? One? We, these studies... Uh, Almost all of them that you saw in that were one application done at different times and in different ways. We were comparing, I didn't have the time to go through all the different treatments on the bottom there, but they were applied either by a direct uh, inoculation with a needle, a, a droplet puncture method that we typically use for xylella itself, or sprayed on at different times. So it was, it was largely timing and method of application. We did try uh, 
a couple of treatments where we inoculated repeatedly, thinking we could get a booster of the bacterium. Surprisingly, they, for whatever reason, weren't any more effective than the individual inoculations. This past summer, I didn't have time to show you the data from the, this summer. We did an elaborate study where we looked at two application methods. One was droplet puncture indirectly into this plant or spraying. But we, we applied them once uh, at, a, at one time, but starting four weeks before we would inoculate with a pathogen, up until like 12, 15 weeks after we inoculated to see when, if you only were going to spray one, and the idea would be if growers may only want to inoculate once at most, when would be the best time to inoculate? And what we found was that they were basically all equally effective, put on four weeks, four or three weeks before, up until about seven weeks after the inoculation with the pathogen in grape. At that point then, apparently enough growth of the pathogen had occurred that there wasn't enough of a response to the paraburcled area that it would have eliminated the pathogen from those plants. But it was a curve that was basically equally effective over that entire period up until almost three or four weeks before symptoms typically would have happened in the plant. So it, we find it dramatic that, you know, even though plant is now, the pathogen must have been throughout the plant at that point, still inoculation with the paraburcaldaria eliminated the bacterium and basically prevented all symptom development until shortly before symptoms themselves would have happened. In grape. Thank you very much. So I think we, okay. we will have plenty of time to follow on the discussion over coffee time. Thank you very much for the presentation. So th the next presentation will be by Donato Boscia from the Institute for Sustainable Plant Protection of the National Research Council in Italy, CNR. And the title of the presentation is uh, Major Results and Challenges of the EU H2020 Ponte Project on the Control of Xylella fastidiosa. Donato, the floor is yours. Good morning. So I, uh, Ponte, the Ponte Project is, uh, has been funded by the uh, Horizon 2020 program, and uh, it uh, is a project that uh, started four, four years ago. It is a four-year project, so it will end uh, this week, tomorrow, indeed. And uh, it is a quite a large consortium, uh, including 25 uh, uh, different, uh, 25 different partners, but, and uh, with uh, uh, belonging to, to 13 different, uh, 13 different uh, countries, and uh, as you can see, not only European, there are also three uh, countries that are uh, third country, including, uh, including uh, Costa Rica and, uh, and uh, Serbia. Uh, so, and uh, what uh, uh, it, it was, a, it is a, a project that was targeted to different pathosystem because uh, uh, the call at that time was not for one specific, uh, one fas for one specific pathogen and uh, three different pathosystem that are uh, the Xylella fastidiosa uh, that uh, having the major uh, weight in the project, but also Candidatus liberibacter solanacearum and uh, some uh, pathogens of diseases, uh, causing disease in, uh, in the forestry. And, uh, and so here you can uh, see the, the, um, the website of the, of the, um, of the project uh, where you can, uh, you can uh, get more information if you, if you are interested on, especially on the, the other two targeted patho, patho systems. And uh, of course, being not uh, specific for uh, Xylella, but uh, uh, being the project uh, identifies to start the research in, uh, in, uh, in, on Xylella fastidiosa when Xylella appeared for the first time in uh, 
in an epidemic way in, uh, in Europe. Later on, one year later, it has been, uh, um, it has been uh, accompanied by the start of another project that is uh, fully dedicated to Xiela Fastidiosa, that is the XF Actors, uh, to which uh, Ponte project is complementary by, by, by the call. And uh, that's why the end of the project this week will, n will not mean the end of the research, but uh, will be the research will continue with the uh, XF Actors, the other project that is coordinated by Maria Saponari. And uh, this was the scenario uh, the, at the time of the start of the project uh, four years ago when uh, there was a the large axillella outbreak linked to a novel severe olive disease in, uh, in Apulia, in uh, southern Italy. Later on, we know that other major epidemic appeared uh, in, in Europe, like uh, here where we are now, and, or in Spain, mostly. And, uh, and at that time, there were, there were a lot of, of questions addressed to, uh, for, and, uh, uh, first of all, at that time, it was need, there was a need to prove that Xiella uh, was uh, to be the causal agent of the disease, and also to, to, to identify the uh, local uh, and, uh, and the European and the vectors present at, at the local le level in Italy, but also in, uh, in other uh, places in Europe, to understand what, was, uh, uh, what there was need to understand how it spreads in olive groves and how to improve the surveillance at European level and which areas are under threat and uh, how to control sorry and how to control the bacteria in the plant and, and so on so the f what happened oh 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 sorry I don't know what's going on. So let me try. How to control the vectors and how to, how to control the bacterium in the plants, how to control the vectors and how to enhance uh, responsiveness and awareness. So for the first question has been addressed immediately and was clarified in the two years ago when, uh, when uh, it has been proved that symptoms uh, are, can be caused only by uh, inoculation of the Xiella fastidiosa uh, genotype that uh, is present in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Apulia. And uh, the impact of these results is that now we have a tool to screen cultivar susceptibility and to investigate host pathogen in, uh, interaction. And this now is uh, giving to the, the other project, the, the, to the complementary project, the possibility to make the large greenhouse testing uh, that has been started a couple of years ago and extensive transcriptomic analysis, the identification of putative differentially expressed genes uh, linked to the host response for this. Uh, uh, later on this morning, Pasquale Saldarelli will give an oral uh, presentation. And concerning the local and European vectors, um, those are the first vectors identified in Europe, all are so far as Petelbug. And uh, the, um, it has been uh, determined which uh, the, uh, the host preference versus negative selected host plants. So now we have an idea about, uh, about this. And uh, it has been also clarified the phenology of this vector and uh, some very quite interesting experiments have been done to get data uh, with the mark recapture uh, uh, methodology to, to better understand, to, to improve the knowledge on the, on the movement of these vectors uh, in, uh, in natural, uh, under natural uh, condition. There are uh, several oral presentations and a couple of posters that uh, are uh, and will be presented during the conference. 
and uh, which is the impact of this result that targeted survey, uh, uh, the, um, now there are targeted survey in, in Europe for the Spittelbach, since they have been identified as the major vectors. But also, uh, the, 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 they, this allowed also trials for the control of the vector population. Uh, there will be a presentation on Don Giovanni and experimental based parameters to develop models for short range spread as uh, it will be explained uh, during the conference by Gianni uh, Giglioli thanks to the data uh, acquired in, uh, in this uh, task and uh, giving also a contribution because uh, the, there has been also um, an important collaboration with EFSA uh, that uh, for the for the update of the pe pest risk assessment of uh, Xylella that has been released this year, uh, the, the uh, data provided by uh, produced by Pond has been also useful to to support that does uh, this uh, work, this study. So next step that will be done uh, in X Factor now is to continue with. The, to study the transmission characteristics, Bodino will give an oral presentation, and uh, some insight into the transmission dynamics that we will uh, learn some about uh, by Daniele Cor Cornara during, during the conference. How to spread the olives? And uh, well, now the, uh, it has been demonstrated that uh, a study made by the team of Juan Antonio Navas uh, uh, that uh, there, there are clearly aggregate patterns of spread and uh, uh, the infected olives are the main sources of inoculum. I'm, I'm, I'm talking always mo mostly on the epidemic that we have in Apulia that, that was one that inspired the start of this, uh, of this project. Uh, these uh, results are being uh, are now in uh, in a deliverable that has been uh, has been developed has been produced and uh, uh, coordinated by Juan Antonio Navas. Uh, in uh, all the results of the project uh, will be reported in the in the deliverable that uh, uh, will be all public within a couple of months, two three months and uh, how to improve the surveillance at the European level was the, another question. There are two major tasks that has been uh, uh, carried out during the project. One, there, is a, there have been a, a, an important effort of validation and harmonization of the diagnostic protocols. Francois Polyakov will give uh, one uh, presentation on this. And uh, a lot of work has been done to improve the tools uh, to, uh, related to the remote sensing of the, of the bacterium. And uh, the most uh, significant result is uh, reported in this publication, uh, in this paper that was published last year in a Nature Plant uh, by, by, Pablo, uh, by Pablo Zarco. And uh, as an impact of these results, uh, now, uh, for the uh, Ponte project, so the, this work uh, gave a, a major contribu contributed sig significantly to the three revisions of the EPO diagnostic uh, standard that has been published uh, by the EPO bulletin, and, uh, and so that now uh, are the, the EPO protocol for the diagnostic of diagnosis of Xylella. Uh, fastidiosa. And the next step, the work that is uh, underway now in, uh, in, um, in uh, the XF actors is that a similar work that has been done on, uh, of, of the air, uh, airborne campaign done in, the, in Apulia on Olive is now underway in the area of, uh, of Alicante, uh, targeting in this case the the almond to 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 see uh, or to find the right protocol to 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 to, uh, to get the early detection of bacteria in uh, almond po population which uh, area are under threat 
so there is also um, several colleagues uh, work at, on this topic and uh, the two major uh, tasks have been to, to to determine the potential distribution under current and future climate change scenarios and uh, to, um, to, 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 to verify, so to compare and to select the most appropriate modeling methods. Uh, the, the, the deliverable has been coordinated by Juan Antonio Navas again. Here, just as example, you can see the area of uh, the estimated climatic suitability uh, map uh, for Xilella uh, uh, currently. And this is the evolution in 40 years, according to the estimate of the change of the, of the, of the climate changes. And the, as impact of this result, there has been also the, um, the scientists of the project contributed greatly to, to, to the development, to collaborate with the EFSA to, to to, to, to develop the specific chapter in the pest risk assessment updated this year. Uh, how to control the bacteria in the plants? So some lines have been followed, confirmation uh, that phenotypic differences in olive cultivars are supported by different transcriptomic profile genes involved. Genes involved are consistent with previous studies in citrus and grapes and uh, there will be later on uh, the oral presentation given by Pasquale Saldarelli this morning. Uh, also, uh, the, there is a search, uh, uh, as consequence, it has been developed a search of resistant or tolerant olive cultivars, and uh, myself, I will give an oral presentation tomorrow uh, afternoon. Uh, but also, uh, it has been done the testing of uh, the NAC and uh, acetylcysteine uh, uh, applications. Uh, there is uh, an oral presentation that will be given uh, by Alexandra de Souza, but there is also a poster of uh, Enza Don Giovanni uh, in the poster session. And uh, in Pont has been done the first description of the microbiome in olive xylem tissues that uh, allowed the next step to, to be developed in a XF actor, where with the further investigation on the mechanisms of resistance in olive and on the search of resistant olive germoplasm, and extensive investigation on the microbiome in resistant and susceptible olive cultivars. Uh, there will be a couple of oral presentations uh, given by pa Paolo Battista and uh, Massimiliano uh, Morelli. How to control the vectors? A large activity has been also done, especially in Puglia, on, uh, on this uh, topic. For instance, uh, several uh, molecules of insecticides have been uh, tested to identify those that are more uh, uh, that compatible with the legislation are also more suitable for uh, uh, an effective control of the vectors. But also uh, interesting results have been obtained with uh, several uh, experimental field trials uh, on, uh, on, uh, concerning the uh, management of the vegetation of the crops, uh, uh, in particular, particular relevant has been the uh, to prove uh, as the, the tillage, the working of the soil uh, at, uh, at a certain stage of the year, uh, at a certain time of the year, may reduce the, the, the population of the vector, as well as uh, the cultivation of, uh, uh, of species, uh, of uh, plant species that uh, are not preferred by, are not selected by the, the, um, the vectors. This, uh, there will be one uh, oral presentation, I think, given by uh, uh, Enzo Don Giovanni on this, uh, this topic. Next step will be, as exploitation of the results, the use of uh, vibrations to manipulate the behavior of the spittle bug. Uh, an oral presentation will be given by Avosani and uh, uh, testing trapping for monitoring the population. Uh, 
Uh, also, there is a presentation that will be given by Enzo Don Giovanni, and also testing other uh, bioinsecticides, uh, uh, mostly fungal uh, uh, and uh, parasite, uh, uh, entomoparasite. So, how to enhance responsiveness and awareness? There is also an uh, important activity done, a huge activity done on this way because I, just to tell you, there have been several courses that has been developed to, to train uh, people involved in, in, uh, in the laboratory for, for the analysis, for the diagnosis of Oxidella fastidiosa, but a lot of uh, uh, activity of dissemination has been done on both on, uh, on, the, on the social, on the on, the, on uh, collaboration with, uh, um, with the media and uh, a lot of uh, public, uh, um, public um, meeting or uh, seminars have been given uh, also in the, the territories affected by the epidemics. Uh, I think that there are uh, uh, hundred of meetings that has been or, or seminars that have been given by uh, scientists of this of the the project, and uh, of course I apologize because not all the participants are included in this picture. But uh, of course, uh, as coordinator, I have to thank all the participants of the uh, of the pro to the project at the beginning. Uh, uh, 120 scientists, but uh, on the way of the of the project, this uh, this group, this uh, this number uh, has been incre increased, and I do not have the exact uh, inventory of, of of them. And uh, since there is still one, uh, well, uh, maybe I hope there is no audio, but I want I will I would like just to show you one short video. Okay. That has been uh, launched yesterday for uh, to promote to to this, um, the, the, the the results of the project that that will be soon uh, public. As I told you, it's not only Xylella, the project. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you. So now we have time for exchange or discussion. Yeah. Is someone willing to ask a question to Donato? If, if not by now, maybe I have a question, but uh, it's a naive question. But if you had to start again this project with uh, 25 partners, and how would you, let's say, do it? Would you change something? Do you think something about it? Well, uh, well, uh, in this case, uh, uh, as I told you, the, the project was not uh, conceived for Xylella because at the time of the development of the call, Xylella, Xylella was not known yet. So I think that is uh, is quite normal that for uh, for this call uh, to have uh, this kind of uh, uh, multidisciplinary, uh, multi-task approach, but. This has been changed later with the new call that uh, promoted the start of the, the project uh, of XF Acto. So a fully dedicated project uh, to Xylella. Okay. Any questions or points you would like to raise in the audience? On Ponte, we will have a lot of presentations by the yes, actors of Ponte. The, yeah? the, the reason and, is that, that this will be explained later. So we are expecting for this. If, if no reaction by now, Maybe we can use the coffee pause just to interact and uh, discuss this. Uh, I would like to thank uh, all uh, the ones presenting uh, this morning, Leticia Hugo, uh, Steve Lindo, uh, Donato Boscia, 
Um, so the coffee will be organized uh, upstairs uh, at the restaurant Tino Rossi. May I ask you to come back sharply at 11 uh, a.m. just to avoid uh, noise and, and movement in the audience. Thank you very much.